welcome to the Columbus Music Commission's first annual Jingle Mingle. Now I want to thank all our supporters because without you, we would not be able to do the things we do. And in particular, I want to give a big shout out to GCAC, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, for their support. They've been with us from day minus one. Take a bow, Allison and Jamie. <laughs> Angel Lopez. Angel, it's great to have a homegrown hero return. And his family lives here, and Angel's heart is in Columbus. He bestows so much pride on, on our city and our music community. He started out, from what I understand, by setting up a studio in his clothing closet in his mother's apartment. Probably drove her crazy, right? <laughs> and he was mentored by a fellow named Mark Abrams, who is the main producer engineer and runs a program called Pure Mix. Uh, Mark is connected with Vaughn Studios. And Angel gives him, as he respectfully does, such great props and tribute for doing what he's done for him. Now Angel, Angel's a two-time Grammy winner. He's won a Latin Grammy for Maluma. He's won a Grammy for his work with Kanye West. Ooh, did I say Kanye West? I mean, yee. And, um, He's now up for, I think, three more Grammys for his work with Jack Harlow, especially the hit record, First Class. He's now, let's see, he's produced to some of his credits. He's produced Chance the Rapper. He's produced Missy Elliott, Coldplay, The Justins, Justin Bieber and Justin Timberlake, and of course, Jack Harlow. Let's get Angel and Mark up here. Where are you guys? How's everybody doing? City, I see a lot of lovely people here that I know, some of y'all I don't know, but thank you for being here, whether I know you personally or not. Um, it's safe to say though that, minus my wife not being here, you know the most important people in my life are probably in this room, so I'm really grateful for y'all to be here. A lot of people that inspired me. Yeah, I'll let you. I'm not sitting yet, uh, oh. because this man just watched a sold-out KFC Yum Center last night sing the lyrics back to the song that he released over the summer that got 1.92 million streams on Spotify. So I was wondering if we could all stand up and give him oh, a big man. welcome home. <laughs> really glad. Thanks. That's crazy. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I just want to say something, too, before we get started. Mark also got to work on the album. Uh, he got to work on a record for us, so it was real cool to be able to tap in with local talent, especially somebody who means a lot to me, who always mentored me and believed in me, and really helped me through the annoying parts of learning how to make music. So you know I love you, brother. I really appreciate you. So This is fun. Um, shout out to, to Music Columbus and everything that Bruce and the gang are doing here. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's something that I always wanted to figure out, something that I always seeked um, to find a a place that would assist me, you know, my process. And I was lucky enough to have people like Mark, people like City. You know, I'll never forget when Drake came, City hit me up like, man, come to the studio, come drop some beats out. So he was always showing love. He always believed in me. He put me in certain situations. So thank you so much, brother. Good to see you. Well, uh, we'll start where all good stories start. Uh, when were you born? I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Let's fast forward a little bit. So uh, can I tell a story? Yeah. Okay, so the first time that I met Angel, we were playing, we were both playing for an artist named Joseph, if anybody knows Joseph in the yeah. city, yeah. So um, we were playing, it was, it was a church in Mansfield, Ohio, and Joseph's band kind of has a revolving door sometimes, just every once in a while, for anybody who knows him, but, uh, and I was making records with Joseph at that time in my parents' basement, and we were going to play this show. It was like a sold-out church thing. And Joseph, like a couple days before, he like swapped out drummers or something, and I was like frustrated because I'm like, man, we already had the guy, Joseph. So we get on stage, and over we're doing like sound check, and there's a kid on stage with a keyboard, and I'm like, what did he do? So I like look over and Angel's behind this keyboard. You had to be like 15 or something at the time. I was young. It was it was young. 
So I'm like annoyed as we're like going into the set because like here we are, I'm not gonna know what's happening on stage again because he's a new band member and everything. And halfway through the first song, I like couldn't play my guitar because I was just trying to listen to everything that was coming out of my monitor from this guy. He had a talk box on a keyboard like when it was not easy to do that. And it was like some of the most amazing music ever. I remember that, bro. Yeah, it was crazy. That like, was an incredible memory. Yeah, so I just immediately, like after the show, I'm like, who are you? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> no, nah, that was great. That was, yeah. that, that was a, uh, I remember, we were in Cleveland, right? Or like, we went. Yeah. We were we, trying to do shows, which was real cool. Yeah. Um, real intimate and um, humble beginnings for sure. And that's where our friendship started, for real. Totally, yeah. You know, fast forward another couple of years, uh, we hadn't seen each other for a little bit, and Joseph called um, because you guys were you were doing a record in uh, in your mom's house, I believe, in the kitchen. Yeah, mind y'all. Yeah, literally in the kitchen. No, no, sorry, in the dining room. Yeah, let's see, she's making sure I tell it right. <laughs> literally had two speakers and a Nico in the dining room for like months, and she was cool with it. So shout out to my mom. Yeah. <laughs> So Joseph calls because Pro Tools crashed. It's super weird because it never crashes. Pro Tools is pretty <laughs> solid. So, <laughs> uh, so I went over and, and like to try and help get it all going and stuff. And that was like we, we started going back and forth on like production stuff. You were showing me things on the Nico, and that was all crazy. But to think of the um, the amount of work that you've put in from that time. Not even till now, but to the point where things started to make sense to even do it, was insurmountable. It was huge. It was just unbelievable, like how hard you were pushing to do all of that and how hard you had to drive forward to do it. So I thought we could tell a little bit about that story. And if you could tell us about what some of those days were like, like you're yeah. making records in the dining room. Yeah, absolutely. I started playing guitar. Um, my mother was a a singer to a cover band in Tijuana. And um, my uh, my little brother's pops played guitar and I just kind of fell in love with the instrument. I, uh, you know, I saw them rehearse every, I forgot how often you guys rehearse, but I just loved music. I grew up around music. My mom played music. It was kind of cleaning music, which is mariachi music and songs of that, you know, of that nature. Um, so I learned how to play the guitar. I went to a Carlos Santana concert and I was like, that's what I want to do. Obviously, like not like him, but I, you know, it was like it inspired me to see somebody with that instrument just like bring the masses together and um just talk to the people with an instrument. I think it's a beautiful thing to be able to do. Um, and that's really where it started. And then fast forward, I'm gonna go through it a little bit quick. You fast forward a little bit to uh Middle school, I had some friends. I was always banging beats on the table. Like, it was just a thing. We had this thing every Friday night football. There was a huge door under Darby Stadium, and it had a nice bass. And I would just go over there and knock on the grinding beat and just make a bunch of beats, and we'd have freestyles. Um, and that was, I was kind of known for that. Santi, what up? I know you remember those days, because Santi be in there dropping bars, man. <laughs> so, yeah, that was kind of like the beginning of like, oh, we could make, we could make beats, you know? <laughs> Look at that, man. The whole fam's here. I love it. I love seeing it. So, yeah, so it was like, I started figuring out, like, oh, I could take a guitar chord and put a cool drum beat under it with this keyboard. There's a shout out to, like, Jason Smith and Jacob Bragg, who went by Icy Jake, but they were the ones that were actually doing what I was doing on the tables. They were actually figuring out how to put it into an, an mp3 and onto a cd because back then that's what we did we burnt cds in order to listen to music and um he gave me this bootleg version of cool let it um and my mom had this compact presario computer is like this huge looking tower and i just kind of like hijacked it i'm like you know what i'm just gonna take this computer and figure it out and i probably broke it because i'm pretty sure there was a lot of viruses from like downloading just you know <laughs> It was LimeWire and all that stuff, just trying to get the right software. But I learned how to put beats together. And um, you're going to have to cut that out of the video. Nothing was downloaded illegally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Disclaimer. No, I purchased it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, uh, I started learning how to make beats. 
and it was a cool thing. I think it was pretty cool to be able to take my instrument, play, and make a composition out of it. I didn't know how to quantize. I didn't know any of that. You know, quantize is when you, you grab, you know, the set of beats and you put them to a grid. And I was just going by feel and making loops by feel, and it was the weirdest thing because I always, I was always curious, like, how do people make them like, you know, be on beat and like the perfect loop? And I never understood it, but I started learning as I went. Um, very important thing I have to say is Antonio Jeremiah, my friend, he, he walked in one day, because it's a full circle moment, he walked in one day with a Fade of Black by Jay-Z. And I saw that clip of Timbaland playing a beat. Some of y'all might know that. It's like an iconic hip hop moment where he's playing Jay-Z beats. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. And that's what I want to sound like. So that's where my early Timbaland influence um, started. And whether you know this or not, you know the, the story will wrap around, but I ended up being signed by Timbaland. Um, but yeah, I made a beat this one day, and there was I was a fan of this. Uh, it's like a Latin R&B group out west. They were kind of a big deal, to me at least. I mean, they were popping. You know, they're they're very respected in the Chicano community. And I sent over a beat, and I remember I told my mom like, "Hey, they call me back, and they want to fly me out in the middle of exams." And um, and yeah, I mean, I had no keyboard case. Keyboard cases were expensive. You know, I was raised by a single mom. And um, she bought me my keyboard, my Triton LE, and I took over her laptop, and or not laptop, her compact Presario, and I started kind of working off of that. Um, and I got called to go do this during exams, and I was so excited. I was telling people in school, like, yo, this guy, nobody knew who he was, but I was on cloud nine, like, yo, this is, this is it. This is my big break right now. You know, that's how I felt. And I remember, uh, I didn't have a keyboard case, so we made this thing called the Black Burrito. We went to a... Uh, it might have been Joann's or like one of those type of, what was it? Walmart. Walmart. And somehow they made a case for me. I was carrying around this like burrito thing around the airport, which I'm surprised they even let me do that for real because it was, you know, it was crazy. But I show up to Phoenix. Here I am, this like 16-year-old kid. I don't know what quantizer is, nothing. And the artist's name who gave me a shot, his name is MC Magic, and he's a very special person to me. Um, his son is here. He happens to be one of my best friends. Um, but he gave me a shot. That man really was the first person that saw it in me on a major level because individuals like Mark and City and Santi and some of these other people really, you know, they saw it early on, but somebody who already was established and somebody who I looked up to in a sound that inspired me, he was like, oh, you got something. And he flew me out there. So shout out to MC Magic. He's, he means a lot to me. And I remember making the, the one song, and then we made this other song called All My Life that ended up becoming a single, and it was the first shot of success I had in terms of like radio play, and you know, I got to hear my song on the radio, I got to be in a video, see myself on MTV, and it was a cool moment. Um, and yeah, that was that era of it, you know? And I'll, I'll, I'll close that little era of it by saying that I really thought that that was it for me. Like, I was like, this is it. I made it. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, what is it? You were touring and everything. Oh yeah, yeah. I got too, to yeah. do some. I got to do some shows with him. That's where I met Marco. We uh, we had a good time. I got to do some big shows. I was 16. I'd go up there for one song though, for real. It was just like the All My Life song because it was the big song, and um, it was yeah, it was incredible. I had the best time. I got to play in front of 17,000 people shows, and it was a uh, it was a great experience for me. But in my mind, I was like, man, I feel like I made it. You know, I felt cool. I felt like, yeah, this is, this is it. Um, and it wasn't it, you know. I think in life I've learned that uh, there's like stages to this thing, to this walk and whatever it is that you're pursuing. Um, I just knew I loved music. And, uh, and yeah, that was that. that, that, uh, yeah. that How was old that, were you then? That era. I was 16. Yeah. I moved to California early. I lived with my Uncle Miguel. And my Aunt Jasmine, they welcomed me to their house and just trying to support me. And sure enough, I ended up back in Ohio because it just wasn't it, you know. Um, I wasn't finding the groove locally. You know, I, I, I hadn't met City yet at that time. Um, but I was trying to kind of figure out, you know, why it didn't work out. I had a song on the radio. I thought, again, that was it. And uh, I ended up back in Ohio. And it was a very humbling experience because it was like, all right, what are you going to do now? And I started doing jobs in between, but I was always pushing to do music. And my mom, my grandfather, they always supported me, um, even though the family would kind of come in and say, you know, like, hey, bro, you kind of got to get a job. 
Um, I just knew I was meant to do music. Like, a matter of fact, I think that one of my yearbooks, I said, like, that's what I'm going to do. There's no option B, and I always just set out to do that. Um, so, yeah, so fast forward, humbling experience. Right around 2000, what was it, like 2009, um, I met P. Black. I don't know if you all know who P. Black is. P. Black is, that's the guy. Linked up with P. Black. There was a cool scene, J-Raw, like everybody, Rashad, they, there was a dope scene in Columbus happening. L.E., everybody. That was like the vibe, and I was really inspired. And, and I, not that I wasn't welcome in that circle, but I, I just hadn't earned my stripes, because they were like the dope kids, like dope producers, dope music. But P. Black went to school with me in Hilliard, and um, we got linked up, and he came over one day, and we made some songs that made it on his mixtape uh, called Chicken and Waffles. So... It was an incredible project. I had a great time with my bro. Um, but that's when I started dabbling locally. I met City through Giovanni, another good friend of mine that I'm sure y'all know. He's an incredible artist. So the period between your back from tour and until that moment happened, in between there, what's kind of going on? Because like you were saying, like there was pressure. And I remember this from during our sessions. Like We would have conversations. You'd be like, Dude, I gotta, I gotta do something else. And there were a couple extra things, like you, you were part of a church leadership group mm -hmm. for a while. You were, um, were you the worship leader? At one, one no, I was, I was assisting the church. I played guitar. I played lead guitar in the worship band, um, and I helped plan it. And I kind of handled like the production stuff, well, audio production stuff, yeah, um, of the church. So there was a lot of in betweens. I took on jobs, you know, because you get the pressures. I met my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, Amira. Um, and it was like, like, man, like, what do you have for this girl? What are you doing? But I knew I was doing the right thing because I just always felt it in my heart that I was meant to do music. Like, if there's one thing I know how to do is music. If you ask me to change a tire, I probably can't change a tire. And that's probably a very shameful thing to say, but it's really true. But if you ask me to make a song, I could definitely make a good song, you know? Okay, so I knew about, like, there was a church one, and then there was a period in there where you were training to... Um, become a diamond seller? Oh, yes. So, yeah. so we'll fast forward. Yeah. So 2014, um, I'm on my way to get married with my wife. And I literally, like, I'm broke. I, I was working in a construction company, you know, just check by check, borrowing money week to week from my best friends. Just like, yo, bro, can you spot me 200? I get paid Friday, whatever. And just literally living day to, you know, week to week, as they call it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm on my way to get married, and I'm, like, exchanging the money because we got married in Cancun. And uh, from the side of my eye, Timbaland passes. Like, I saw I had the craziest Timbaland stories. It's crazy how it all wrapped around. That's but not he, the first one. Oh, no, either. definitely not. Yeah. But he, he, like, comes across, and I, like, I forgot about my money. I think I just turned around. The lady was probably like, bro, like, you know, you kind of need this. But I just turned around, and I was just in awe because that was, like, not... God, I don't idolize people like that, but it was someone who I was, I've was i always looked up to. Timbaland is one of the greatest producers of all time, and I, I'll say that for real, because he's incredible. The man really thinks outside the box, and he's shown it with all the records that he's done. But anyway, I, uh, yeah, like, you know, I turn around, obvious thing to do when you see a celebrity, yo, can I get a picture? I didn't, I didn't have the uh, mannerisms of, you know, or understanding what it's like of dealing in the first thing. And of course they said no. They're like, no, bro, he's about to miss his flight. He was all like dripped out. I think he was heading to the MTV Awards. I was like, okay, cool. But it was kind of like a little plant. And at this time I'm at the airport in Miami and I'm getting ready to quit music because it just wasn't working. You know, I had to, I had to figure it out. I'm about to get married to this beautiful woman um, who comes with the family that uh, they studied, they all had you know, something to show for, and I really had nothing. Um, so I was picking up this diamond book based on my dad's a jeweler, the whole family on my dad's side, is, it's in the jewelry business. And um, yeah, I thought, I thought like, damn, like I really made it, I really made it to this point where it's time to just kind of hang up the gloves and just, you know, look at life from a real uh, point of view. It wasn't the case though, like deep inside, I knew that wasn't the case, I, I knew, I just knew it. I mean, it's sometimes I'm sure we've all had those times where inside your heart you have that feeling. And it's a very cliche thing to say that you got to pursue it. But I really implore you all to pursue that feeling in whatever it is, whether it's music, art, whatever it is. And I just followed that gut feeling. 
I felt like Timberland being in that room, it just gave me a whole perspective. We went, we got married, came back, and then this was in August. And then I just started putting my head down. I saw Instagram was popping with producers like Illmind who built the what is to me the producer community right now like in America really in the world he built an amazing thing he was doing sample packs um I was already hip with Superstar oh Superstar I, I had all bro I bootlegged all your kits sorry bro <laughs> had to though <laughs> on, on <wire. laughs> you, you had the fire kits though for real man you and Johnny y'all had some incredible sounds but um where was I um yeah so I came back from a from Cancun, we got married, beautiful celebration. And um, fast forward to like December, and I, I wasn't the type of dude that would post stuff online, like beats and stuff. It was just never my style. I always, I, it wasn't coming from a bougie spot, like a, like a I'm too good. I just didn't like posting stuff. It's almost like, you know, music is a very, a very intimate thing. Whenever I share music with anybody that nobody's heard, it's like, we're exposing, you know, we had a listening session for J Lo's album the other day, and right before I, I looked over to her. I'm like, "This is so weird. Like, I feel like we're about to stand in front of the room naked." You know, I literally told this woman that. She said, "I agree." You but, said that to your aunt. <laughs> yeah, well, my aunt. We'll get to <laughs> we'll that story. That, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's a it's a very intimate uh thing, and I never I never liked uh sharing music like that. But something you know, I started sharing beats because that's what people were doing on Instagram. And um, somehow, some way in December, I believe my wife was tagging just, Timbaland had maybe like 80,000 followers. And my wife was just tagging the crap out of me for one video that I had up. It's wild. The beat was probably real whack, but it caught his attention. And I think the reason it caught his attention is because I wasn't trying to do what everybody else was trying to do. I was trying to replicate his sound in a new way, trying to do pop music in a way. I always called myself a pop producer. And um, sure enough, he DM'd me. I didn't know if it was Timbaland, though. The blue check, I don't think the blue check was a thing yet. I don't remember when the blue check became a thing, but basically the blue check is like, you're verified. You're like, that's really you. So I didn't know if I was talking to Timbaland. I might have been talking to somebody else, whatever. I just trusted my gut. I'm like, you know what? It says Timbaland, 80,000 followers. Kind of makes sense. I went with the gut feeling. And he would just message me like, yo, send me more clips. So I just started grinding. And I'll never forget the day my wife said, you know what? You should probably focus and take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I'll work, which is really insane. Because in our culture, that doesn't happen. You know, in our culture, they teach you where you're the man. You provide for your woman. Um, that's kind of like the, 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 it might be an old school way of thinking for real. It is. Yeah, it's terrible now I think about it. But that's what it was. I felt the pressure, and um, she kind of just took over and started working at Applebee's, long hours, double shifts, just grinding while I stayed home making beats every day to send to who I thought was Timbaland. It was Timbaland, by the way, but I, w I wasn't sure if it was Timbaland or not. And uh, one day, he, I just got a call. I, I, actually, let me rewind a little bit. My friend Gildy Flores, who was also another mentor of mine and producer, I, uh, I had Tim Timbaland's email already. And in my heart, I was like, he's a film composer. He's incredible. And I've never been the type of person that likes to keep. I don't like being a gatekeeper. Like, if you're my friend and I believe in you, like, I'm going to do what it takes to put you on or figure it out. And I literally, that's what I did. I, I just called Gildy one day. I was coming home. I think I was heading to church to sound check. And I'm like, yo, bro, um, this is Timbaland's email. And he's like, oh, wow. What do you want me to do with it? I'm like, bro, just write him. Show him your film stuff. And they connected. Tim called him before me. He, he hit me up like, yo, man, I was on the phone with Timbaland until like 3 in the morning. I'm like, word, he hasn't called me. I was feeling some type of way like, damn, what did I just do? But no, nah, I was feeling happy, you know. It's like, Gildy's like family, man. He's an incredible guy. He lives in Texas. And um, that was that. So then his trade-off was, man, I'm going to give you Timbaland's number. I'm like, bruh, like, I can't just call Timbaland. He hasn't called me. He called you. You know, but he gave me Tim's number. I didn't save it. I just knew it was a 305 number. We're watching the Grammys this one night. I live in Galloway in this little one-bedroom apartment where my studio's in the laundry room. And uh, 305 comes up. And ironically, it was during Sam Smith's performance. He was performing that year. And uh, I just picked up the phone and, yo, it's Timbo. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. Sorry. 
I was like, oh, like, this is really you, bro. And uh, I think I started hyperventilating. My wife started freaking out. She started like, and I ran to my little closet studio and I sat there and spoke to the man for about two hours. And we didn't even talk about music. That's the crazy thing. We spoke about God. We spoke about relationship. We, I feel like we connected on a much deeper level than just like, oh, hey, I want to be mentored by you or how can you change my life? It wasn't that. It was like, let me get to know you. Like, you're my hero. Hear me out. I want to hear you out. And I really got to hear him out. You know, he spoke, he, he was in a very particular patch of his life, which I wasn't aware of then. But I started speaking, you know, kind of church into him. Some of the stuff I was learning in church, it was lining up with his life without me knowing that he was going through a very uh, difficult divorce. But that's the type of stuff that we start, you know, that's how me and Timbaland's conversation started. And I'll never forget, he sent me this text and said, man, I just called my mother and I told her about you. And you're literally like an angel. Like, I'm so grateful for you. And that was the beginning of our relationship of me really like talking to the Timbaland. You know, that was the voice. And you, the superstar, you know, you know, Tim, he's an incredible human. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where that walk started. Uh and from then on, my wife was still working at Applebee's, and my Hold job. On one second, did Timberland give you money for the sounds? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody bootlegged those kids. <laughs> Trust me, I still tap into them, by the way. But uh, yeah, so I my job became making beats, literally making beats, and uh, I thought that's what a producer job was. Was you just gotta like put some 808s, hi hats add music, blah, blah. And that was my perception of what a producer was. I had no idea that this man was about to teach me what being a real producer is. And um, you fast forward to that summer, my wife and some of our best friends, Jazz, uh, their cousin from Mexico and Orlando, we took a trip to Miami, road trip. We were like, you know what, let's go to over there. And we ended up in this Airbnb that had like bugs, like some sort of bugs. It was disgusting though. But I was inspired. I'm like, I'm in Miami. I know Timbaland lives here. I'm going to make a beat. And I popped my headphones. They went somewhere. I stayed in. I made this beat, and I sent it to him. He's like, yo, let me take you out to dinner. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, this beat, this beat just got me a dinner with Timbaland. Bro, I showed up to this fancy place, like all designer stores. I go there now, and it's incredible because I remember the first time I went there, I felt like, Every time I, because it is hot in Miami. I'm sure a lot of y'all have been to Miami. It is humid. A big guy like me doesn't do, hum I don't take humidity well. And every time the AC opened, I would walk by the doors because the AC would just like bless me with like, whew. felt like very expensive air. Because, you know, it's a very, it's called Bell, Bell Har Ball Harbor in, uh, in Miami. And I waited for Timberland for like four hours, yo. Like, he was mad late. He was like, yo, I'll be there in an hour. And I'm just like, you got to stick. Bro, I ended up waiting in the restroom, like, for real, because it was so hot, you know, and I wanted to be fresh when he came. We were about to have a nice dinner. I went into the restroom because it was AC. I was just sitting there staring at myself, pacing back and forth, like, yo, you're about to meet your hero. Sure enough, he shows up. He's on the phone, dapped me up, and we had an incredible conversation. And one of the biggest takeaways, he just wanted to hear me out. He's somebody that really listens. And I got to see how this kind of plans out in the room with artists once he started bringing me in. But he's someone who really just pays attention. He wants to know about you, and he wants to see how he could really execute through you. And he did that. And one of the biggest words he told me is, like, look, you're very talented. Um, I'm going to teach you. You know, I'm, I'm going to take you with me, and I'm going to teach you my ways and teach you how to do this. But the one thing that resounded with me, he's like, don't worry about the money. It's going to come. You know, and little did he know that we were struggling. Um, like, like big time. I mean, wife was making it happen. She was, she was doing an incredible job bringing a lot of money from serving. But it was still, you know, y'all know how it is. Like, life happens, man. Like, those bills don't stop coming. Whatever. He had no idea. And, um, yeah, Tim... Uh, he gave me those words, and then it, it, it was just emails. It continued to be emails, 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 sending more beats, and he didn't put me in the room. And then one day, there was this, uh, I saw him in, in Vegas, and he's like, yo, I got this guy called Gary the Executioner. I'm like, damn, that sounds scary. <laughs> and I figured out why, because Gary Morella, he's my manager, by the way, and he's incredible. He just makes it happen. This man changed my life. He changed Timberland. He turned Timberland's life around because Tim was going through a very dark process that you know, it started taxing him on the way he worked with artists and um, 
Yeah. So Gary gets involved. And one day he just calls me randomly. He's like, hey, man, there's this like Skylander TV show and they want Timbaland to do the music. But Tim's a little busy right now. Um, would you like to uh, help out, you know, and he'll guide you, whatever. They asked for a beat. They're like, they have a song, they have a beat. But I was always the top. I remember seeing this clip from Diddy a while ago where he spoke about he likes people that take action, um, not wait for instruction. So I took that advice from a Diddy clip and said, they're asking me for a beat, but I'm going to give them a song. And I'm going to make sure I give them the song that's going to be the theme song to this thing. And sure enough, Timbaland had hooked me up with uh, a songwriter from Nashville called his name's Dalton, great friend of mine. And he came up, um, and I was like, yo, bro, um, here's the beat. You know, let's make a song. And sure enough, we landed the Skylanders theme song. And, uh, and that was, like, the first time I got to see, you know, real money. Because it was a nice paycheck. I had never seen anything. But before that, before I saw that paycheck, I'll never forget sitting in the bathtub because we had an eviction notice um, at our door. Literally, like, you have this many days to pay. And that was a scary place to be in. And I remember calling Gary, and Gary just helped me. He, he didn't even take commission off that. He was just like, I'm going to help you. I believe in you. Timbaland believes in you, and we're going we're gonna to do some business together. And, um, yeah, that check came in, and it kind of just alleviated, and I got to see a little taste of what hard work is without worrying about the money, you know? Because one thing about music is you can't do it for money. You got to really love music. And what? there's a reason. <laughs> if you want money, you got to be some, you know, there's other jobs because it's, it's not, it's lucrative. I'm not going to lie. My life has changed. I'm in a different position financially now, but it's not, it's never been the, the purpose or the reason why I do music. I just really love music. Um, and uh, yeah, Skylanders happened. Um, started getting a little bit more trust within the Tim Circle, and one day I got the call. Uh, have y'all seen the, uh, what's that movie with Dennis Quaid? Is that his name? The, the Rookie? It's a baseball movie. Yeah. yeah, when he gets the call up to the big leagues, right? And I had that moment. I got called up. I feel like I was in triple A. Maybe I was in double A still, but I got called up, and they were like, yeah, Sam Smith's going to be in the studio with Timbaland, and you're coming out there. I'm like, word. And it's Sam Smith. You know, go figure Tim calls me during Sam Smith's performance. So it was like, to me, I just started closing little circles in my head. Like, yo, this is kind of cool. There's definitely, you know, God's definitely up to some. And uh, he definitely was. Because I showed up. I remember I posted a picture that day of me going on a plane. And I just posted the cover of The Rookie. And, you know, it was me trying to be cool on social media, like on some subliminal. People are probably like, okay. <laughs> okay. You know, but it was a way for me to say, like, yeah, I'm getting called up. And I did. I got called up. I went in, and I got to work on a record called Prey, um, which was a single, and it's I think it's double platinum now. But um, that was my first big, that was like the domino, that kind of, uh, every time you make a song in the business, it's like you get keys. And it's a lot of perception. Superstar, you know this. It's like you're as good as what you've prior done. That's just the way it is. If you made a hit, all of a sudden you're the greatest thing, and everybody's going to talk. It's crazy. You're still the most talented person, but if you don't have a hit, it's like the perception in the industry is really twisted, and it's something they have to learn how to accept and move past. And anyway, that song gave me the keys to the next door. It allowed me to, you know, oh, he worked with Sam Smith, and it's like, oh, yeah, we got to bring him in this room. And that's where everything just kind of started culminating and started taking off. Um, that was like in 2017. And it led to me working with, like, Armin Van Buren. I met another hero. Oh, check this out. I got to tell this story. Um, I show up to Miami for my first session with Timbaland. And uh, Scott Storch walks in. So I don't know if y'all are hip or not, but Scott Storch and Timbaland had a lot of beef back in the day because Timbaland said, I'm a real producer. You're just a piano man, which was mad disrespectful. But, you know, it was, it was hip-hop beef. It was culture. And I'm sitting there, and Scott Storch walks in the room at Hit Factor, and I'm like, wow, what is about to happen? They hadn't seen each other since. It had been a few years. But my first session with Timbaland, I got to throw it out there, was with two legends. It was with him and Scott Storch. And Scott Storch is like, he's an icon. He's done, like, the first hip-hop song I ever heard, which is, you know, Dr. Dre. Incredible producer. Y'all, I don't have to say who that man is. He's, he's that guy. But um, anyway, yeah, fast forward to that. And uh, we start stepping into a territory where I'm doing sessions with Timbaland. 
And a lot of times I wasn't doing much. I was sitting there, just, he was teaching me how to read the room and I didn't understand. I would play something, he'd be like, uh uh, like real strict, but in a loving way. You know, I feel like he was really trying to get something across my head. And it was that it's not always about adding. Sometimes it's good to just sit and read the room and understand what's going on. And me really capture what the job of a producer is, which it wasn't making beats. In my head, I went into it saying, oh, I'm gonna make a beat for this artist and there's the song, you know? And it's not about that. He was teaching me how to pay attention to what the artist wanted to do, read their energy, understand when they're uncomfortable, understand when they're in their head writing, but you could give them a little something to inspire or take them on a different journey, um, you know, to, to come back around to the song. And uh, I started picking up on all these things, and eventually it got to the point where it was like cool for me to play stuff now, or cool for me to make suggestions. And he kind of just slowly started giving me layaway in the room, and artists started seeing that. Um, and yeah, we could we could move on to the. We talk about Kanye West. Are y'all cool? I mean, I I understand it's a really, uh, kind of. I was thinking one thing that we should chat about was that first time in the room. Yeah, with Kanye. Yeah. Yeah, so we get, I was, in, I was in Miami with my team. We had this thing called Team Timbo, Timbaland. He always had like a few of us producers under him. And it was Fat Ed, myself, and the Mosley Bros. And we're working with Saweetie. Um, we actually did a song that did real well. It was my, my first number one uh, hip hop. No, what was the chart it hit? It, it was rhythmic, my first rhythmic number one. It was called Back to the Streets. It was made that night. And um, I'll never forget, my, I was kind of always the point of contact in the room. My, my manager had promoted me to SVP of a and so I would overlook everything for our uh, management company and just kind of overlooking everything really for Timbaland and everything went through me. So he called me, he's like, yo bro, it's Art Basel. Kanye is in town, he's coming. I'm like, word, like, what do you mean he's coming? He's like, yeah, he'll be there. And we were so tired, it was three in the morning and I looked at the guys and I said, yo, they just told us Kanye is coming in the morning. Let's just push through and try to create something so that when the man walks in, we have something to play him. I don't know if we're going to get to play it. I don't know what the vibe is going to be. It's Kanye. I had never met him. And uh, yeah, we stayed there till like seven in the morning. We created like two songs and we go to sleep. <laughs> and then two hours later, we get the call. Kanye is on the way to the studio. I was like, damn, two hours of sleep, mind you. I had to wake everybody up. You know, I had to call the lobbies like, hey, can you dial this person, dial that person? And sure enough, we showed up to the studio. Um, we're all chilling. Ye hadn't showed up. And then I'm about to walk to the restroom. And as I step out, Kanye walks in. I'm like, oh shit, this is crazy. Cause I'm a huge, you know, that man is, he's made some of my most favorite like hip hop records. And I'm sure there's a lot of people here that agree with what he's done, you know, outside of, everything that's going on. But um, yeah, he walked in, he shook my hand. He's like, I'm like, I'm Angel. Walked in the room, he peeped the room. He's like, who's this? I'm like, it's, you know, it's, it's our team, it's Timbaland's team. And that was it. He looked in and he went in there and he started playing music for us. And it was like a one-on-one -on -one private Kanye concert. It was the most iconic thing ever. Cause he was dancing. He was doing his, I'm sure you guys have seen this. A little yay swag, you know? It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. In my head, I was just like, this, there's no way this is really happening. And um, the room got quiet. There's a lot of silent moments with him because he thinks a lot. Um, and it was silent, and I didn't know him. I didn't know there was a lot of silent moments with him sometimes where you just kind of let him think. And then he proposes, you know, what the vibe is going to be. And I'm like, yo, bro, we want to play you something. And we played him this one thing. And um, he heard it. We didn't get much reaction. And then he just stayed quiet. And I'm like, damn, this is terrible. <laughs> we just spent the whole night making this. And out of nowhere, it's quiet. And he just kind of looks around. He's like, is there, is there restrooms here? I'm like, yeah, is there showers? Yeah. Is there beds here? No, but we could get some. Like, yeah, we're going to do my album this week. And he just stepped out. And that was that. And we just got the text of, we're going to do Kanye's album. Which it wasn't the case, by the way. We worked the whole week with Kanye, but it wasn't... Uh, the album that became Jesus is King. It was, it, it was Yandi then. And um, yeah, that's what started that journey. That was the first time in the room with Kanye West, yeah. which was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, it was surreal. I still scratch my head, y'all. Like, 
I know I get to work with a lot of cool people, but it's always like, this is crazy. This is really happening, you know? Yeah. And that's the Ye story. And um, Ye and I clicked. Um, he took my number, and I kind of became the point of contact. He wouldn't call Timbaland. He started calling me for everything. I'll never forget New Year's. Um, I used to write down everything that Ye, when Ye would call, I would literally, I have this notebook. I still have it in my bag. I would write down everything that man said because he gives you a lot. And if I have this man's attention and he's telling me, I think it's important for me to really, you know, it's, it's, it was really a privilege to be able to have this man call me and give me his ideas. I remember New Year's, he called me, he's like, yeah, man, I want to start a church. I'm like, word. <laughs> <laughs> he know I'm in Ohio. I'm over here. It's like Christmas tree lights up. I could hear Kim in the background and his kids. I'm like, wow, this is unreal. But he started just saying, you know, I want to do, I want to take my music and turn it into light. I want to talk about Christ and what Christ is doing in my life. And um, it was a beautiful moment because I was, you know, I'm a man of faith. Um, and that was a real interesting time for him to say, hey, I want to turn these songs into Christian songs. And that's where that whole conversation started that led to Sunday service and so on. Fast forward, you know, I ended up working on six songs of Jesus is King because of that relationship with Kanye. And um, I learned a lot. I spent six months with him almost daily. He took, us a, he took me on a PJ to uh, the Rodent Crater. I mean, man changed my life. I learned a lot from him, too. But that's the Kanye story. I'll keep it short because there's more. I want to talk about Coldplay too. Yeah. Well, Coldplay was before all this. <laughs> yeah, it too, was. Right? Yeah. So let's rewind a little bit. Uh. And let's start with what Coldplay meant to you guys. Too. Yeah. So I proposed to my wife to Yellow the, by Coldplay. She walked the aisle to Yellow. And um, Coldplay was kind of our thing. It was one of our first dates. We went and... I don't know how I got the money, but I got the money and we sat in the pit and we were there all day and we were in the front row of a Coldplay show. I never imagined I'd work with them, ever. I mean, come on, like Coldplay, that's like the greatest band, right? Yeah. And sure enough, um, I'm chilling one day and Gary calls me and he's like, hey bro, Coldplay's in Miami and he wants to see Tim and I want you to be there. I'm like, wait. and he he already knew what Copa meant to me. That was a big call. That was like, that was like getting called up to the All Star game. Now, you know, I'm already in the pros. That was an All Star game call up. And um, yeah, I flew to Miami, and then he told me he's like, hey, by the way, I'm flying your wife over there, but you're not supposed to know. And he did it because he didn't want me to get nervous. He knew how nervous I was already. Cause come on, it's Coldplay. Like, what am I doing in the room with Coldplay? And we showed up and we started jamming and Chris is such a beautiful person. He's an incredible human, incredible songwriter, incredible artist. And we just kind of clicked. And that was that, we did that session. We went to the concert. I, uh, I got to be in a suite with this artist named Juanes and Mary J. Blige, which I was just like, oh my gosh. When she walked in, I felt so rude. I was talking with one of the artists and when she walked in, I dropped everything. I'm like, yo, Mary J. Blige, bro. <laughs> you know? But um, yeah, I was young. I was still learning the etiquette on how to behave around artists of such caliber. And um, yeah, that was Coldplay's story. And then Coldplay calls back. Chris calls back and says, hey, I want to see you in Malibu. By that time, my good friend Fede had joined. He's an incredible producer, musician. He's a genius. I look up to all my peers, by the way. Like, if I work with you, I, it's because you know, I really admire and I really get inspired, and I believe in high levels of collaboration. Feta was one of those people in my journey so far where we were able to do some incredible things together. Um, and that's when Coldplay happened. Uh, Tim was sick, he landed, he was sick, and me and Feta showed up, and Chris showed up sick still, and he showed up with us, and we did like two songs that ended up on, on the album, Everyday Life, um, and he just started calling us. Uh, I remember it was a long ride. It's like 45 minute uh, Uber ride from Malibu to the other side. And I'll never forget, me and Feta just looked at each other like, yo, he's going to call us back. Yeah, he is. And sure enough, the calls just started coming every week. Hey, guys, we're here. Hey, guys. And that's how our relationship started with Coldplay and another person who I've learned a lot from. Um, it's like every artist has always just blessed me with a token that I've been able to use with yeah. people like Jack and some of the other younger artists, you know, because they're icons. They've seen a lot. They've done a lot. And I've always been able to uh, be present enough to 
to kind of extract some of that essence that of greatness. You know? There was a, um, a thing that you told me about once with uh, Chris that when you guys would show up to sessions, he had, he had a thing that he would say to the room. Oh, yeah. I think you tell it better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things about making music is you got to remember, or making any art. I mean, obviously, we're talking about music because we're, you know, Music Columbus, and that's what I do. But it's like you got to have fun. Um, it's important to have fun. You can't take it serious. It's like, art is a gift. Music is a gift. And if you're privileged enough to know how to create, you got to have fun with it. It's no pressure. And that's the one thing he always... One of the biggest takeaways was that is like, he's kind of stopped the session. He's like, yo, y'all having fun? I'm like, of course we're having fun. I mean, you're kind of Chris Martin, you know. I think uh, Thundercat was there. I don't know if y'all know who he is, but he's probably one of the greatest musicians alive. He was there. And uh, a few other people, Dav on the strings. It was a crazy session. He just stopped everything. Like, yo, y'all having fun? And he just put music creating in a very simple way of like going fishing. And he said, you know, this is, I see this as coming out and fish, and throwing the reel in. And um, some days you're going to catch small fish. Some days you're going to catch no fish. But as long as you're having fun, uh, you know, that's all that matters. And then it was quiet. And he's like, but one day you might catch a real big fish. <laughs> and that would be a good day, right? And sure enough, he was right because I found that out with first class, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's one of the main principles, one of the main takeaways I had from there. Um, I'm sorry it's so random. I just think it's important that y'all see the walk of how it's mind boggling for me. I haven't told the story in sequence really that much. Um, so it's just crazy for me to be able to look at it and see like, wow, like we really made it out of here and we're doing some crazy stuff. It's really unbelievable to me still. I know y'all are looking at me like, yo, you're doing it, but it's, it's still unbelievable to me. It's quite humbling. All right. So, um, that little record named Jesus is King happened. Yeah. And then uh, you, there was some, some Grammy stuff that came along with that. Yeah. And we got a Grammy. And we got an actual Grammy. You know, sometimes you, you work on this whole Grammy. Now, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we got a... I remember I got home and there was a package and I opened. I'm like, yo, this is the real <laughs> shiny, you know. Um, and it was nice. But, you know, it's something that everybody asks me. I remember people reaching out like, man, what does it feel like? And it's like, bro, like, I'll be honest, this is just bonus. This is just, it's just the result of me loving what I do and showing up and sacrificing a lot. Because I've sacrificed a lot. I was just talking to Mark upstairs and it's like, I've taxed my health, my relationship. I've, I've taxed everything because I know what it takes to work at this level. And, you know, there's a few individuals in here that do what I do as well and at high level and, it's, um, it's taxing, but it's something that you have to be willing to sacrifice. And it's something that I always uh, just knew. I know the territory, you know? Yeah. And um, wait, what point were we at? Oh, yeah, so well, the Grammy. Yeah, let's, let's make a, a little, like, bookmark, though, because we got to come back to that. Yes, love it. <laughs> cool. um, so, yeah, so I got the Grammy, and it was cool. You know, I think it's cool when you get, to me, it's a bonus. I think it's cool when you get those type of accolades, but you can't get hung up on them. Um, it's, it's just a reminder that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and it's great and everything, but it doesn't make me a greater person or anything like that. Perception in the industry, it was crazy. It was like, oh, you got the, you got the Kanye West, Angel Lopez, you know, shiny thing. Come work with us. So it was cool. But other than that, I mean, it's just, it's just a reminder to me more than anything of keep doing what you're doing, bro. It's working. And you're definitely on the path. Um, but it's not something that I said, oh, one day I'm going to get a Grammy. One day I'm going to work with Kanye, or work with Coldplay. I just, one day I'm just going to keep making music. And that's what led to all these cool things that have been happening in my life. You know? Yeah. And in, you know, some of our, like, early days in the 2010s, like, doing sessions at Vaughn and everything, those were never the conversations. It wasn't like, no. my goal is to go make a Coldplay record. My goal is to go make a Kanye record. You were always just showing up to make music, like yeah. first and foremost. Yeah, local artists, artists from church, David Lamas, Ben. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, it was just showing up because I loved it. I genuinely loved music, and I used to get paid $100, $200 a beat, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, came a long way from that, but 
again, it wasn't for the money. When I was able to get some money out of it, charge $20 for someone to come record at my house, even though I didn't really know how to record. But I got $20, you know, that was food. It was some. Yeah. Um, it was never the money. That's the one thing I could tell anybody in here pursuing this road or whatever it is. It's like, you gotta find passion and you gotta find purpose in it. You gotta have a why. And it's gotta be greater than a result. You know, money and flashy things are cool, but there's no better satisfaction than having your own purpose. Um, yeah. And I think that's one of my biggest fuels that keeps me showing up. I'm tired right now. I got done with Jack's album, went straight into JLo's. I had maybe two weeks uh, to go to Costa Rica with my wife, and I've just been nonstop, and it's going to be nonstop. You know, we're mm -hmm. mixing the, song, the record right now. Got to do that, and then I'm shooting back over here with Jack. So it's like nonstop, but I love it. Um, because I love being able to create something out of nothing. It's a, it's a high that I chase. And more than anything, a newfound purpose is, man, sitting there in that arena yesterday, seeing people sing that song, like, God, Lee, that was such a beautiful moment. It really, it's a, I can't explain the feeling, but it's really incredible. I had some moments last night where I'm like, these people are singing word for word all these songs that I created yeah. that came out of a conversation between Jack and I on a text, you know? Yeah. It's real gratifying. Those well, let's talk the, about that record. How did that? Yeah. How did it start? Again, Timbaland, man. Y'all, it's crazy how Timbaland has played. You know, he played. He's played such a huge part. He mentored me. He taught me how to become a record producer. Um, and he walked me into the room with Jack Harlow. Uh, it's 2022, 2021, early 2021. Um, we're in Miami. I was excited. My wife had already told me about Jack Harlow. My wife has an incredible ear. She's always putting me on to incredible music, which I really love that she has the ear and she just has like taste. I love it. And she brings me new vibes and she brought me Jack Harlow's one time. She's like, you gotta check this kid out. I was like, oh, dope. But I, I didn't know I could get to him. He already had a song called What's Poppin'. That was a huge hit. And that's what he was known for at the moment. So Timbaland set up the session, took Team Timbo out there the Mosley's, Fed and I, and sure enough, you know, I was always kind of natural, a natural leader in the room, and me and Jack just kind of clicked. We had a lot of things in common, soccer, being from the Midwest, and loving the music that we loved, which is like the 2000s, you know, the, the, the juicy stuff, the good stuff. Um, we share that in common, and sure enough, he called me that same night. He was like, hey, bro, I'm gonna be here all week. I'd love for you to just come in um, so again, another result of Timbaland walking me in the door and me just showing up and doing me and the artist just kind of connecting with me. And that was that. And it started an incredible friendship. And he just started calling me a lot more often, like, hey, I'm going to be in L.A., slide through. And one day he just told me, he's like, you know what, bro? I don't see myself creating without you uh, anymore. I, I, I would love to take you on this journey and I would love for you to be in the room and kind of just be, you know, rock with me. And sure enough, you know, that's been the case. He kind of just welcomed me into the space, started showing up, had no idea what we were doing. It went from a certain sound. I got to see the whole album kind of evolve, and we just started seeing things. This album that we did, Come Home, The Kids Miss You, is really a result of something we really wanted to do. We spoke about that last week. We were in the studio in L.A., and it's something that the label didn't come in and say, you got to do this, or nobody. This was in our heart. The sound that we wanted to put, the, the sound selection, the musicality, the music riffs, it was something that was in our heart because it was what inspired us. That's what music was back then. Right now, it's a lot of filter. It's a lot of the same sonics. You know, the creatives in here could probably agree with me that it's it's a really, uh, we're in a really weird time in music. Um, but anyway, we wanted to push that. And I saw greatness in Jack which attracted me more and more to show up to these late sessions. Uh, there were times where 12 days straight, you know, we were doing 4, 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. Or I'd get there at 2 because I'm, you know, I'm kind of the captain of the ship. I always wanted to get there, make sure I had ideas ready, make sure everything was plugged in. And, you know, part of the producer job that you don't really get to see. You think, oh, yeah, you just show up and make a beat for him. Like, nah, you, you got to make sure everything's comfortable. You got to make sure he's set up. You got to make sure that he's gonna show up and the mic is gonna be good and nothing's gonna block our creative process. And I took that job, I've taken that job very serious because he's a great artist. Um, and I really feel he's a generational artist. Um, and 
that's what we started doing. We just started showing up, having fun. And I mean, it was exhausting. I would get up, wake up and say hi to my wife, have breakfast and time to go back to the studio. And it was 12 days in a row like that. We lasted a whole year doing that. First class hadn't become a thing yet. We had a lot of the album. One day he texted me um, like 12 songs on a playlist. And he was like, hey, bro, we should tap into one of these and let's just flip it. And that was like November of last year. And then around February, I had two different ideas. I had this little MPC. Um, I tried one of them. Does anybody know Nemo, by the way? Nemo Achita? Nemo. So that's, that's Jack's right hand man. It's crazy because he has like Ohio ties heavy. Like we were in the same circles, um, which I love. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. So it's crazy that I got to talk about Nemo just quick. Nemo was like Jack's best friend there from Kentucky, and he was always in the scene. And I remember seeing him, and we ended up in the same room with Jack. So it was such a beautiful moment for us because he's an ultra creative person as well that gets amazing things out of Jack. And we all just have this amazing chemistry. Anyway, um, yeah, I remember I tried to flip with Nemo. He's like, nah, let's do something else. And we did something else. Jack wasn't there in the room yet. He showed up, boom. On a different day, I had this groove. Um, I had like the drum groove, like the first class drum groove just kind of playing and I had the sample loaded up already. And I'll never forget, I, you know, I get nervous before I play stuff because I told you it was a very intimate thing. It's nerve wracking. I work a lot in headphones in the studio. Everybody makes fun because they're like, man, you're always just, you're in your headphones in your own zone and then you hit play and the whole room goes crazy. I learned that from Timbaland. He used to do that to us all the time. He'd just be in the, you know, like there's music, picture there's music out here and I'm just in my headphones and then I hit play and I just blow everybody's mind away. I learned how to use that to my advantage. And sure enough, I had the groove and I played the sample and Jack just kind of looked at me and he was like, let's run that. And that was it. And we did first class, you know, penned it up. And um, it took a couple days to get it to what the song became, but we knew it was something special, him and I, because we tapped in, we sampled. You know, when you think about sampling, we go back and sample stuff from them, but to his generation, that's back then. You know, it's hard to accept sometimes to say, y'all know this on this table, but that's what we were tapping into that bag of, let's sample some obvious stuff that was incredible. And that Fergie record was something in my childhood that I remember riding around these streets um, going to school, putting it, you know, burning the CD, glamorous, incredible production by Polo the Don. Um, and sure enough, man, we made that song, and me and Jack always knew there was something about it. We started playing it for people. Girls would come in, people, industry, and they're like, yo, we love everything but that song. And we just kind of knew. I didn't know it was going to do what it was going to do. But um, another result of showing up, loving what you, you know, what you do, and it became a big hit, man. And it's been a life-changing moment for real. I never knew what it was like having a hit record, but I know now and it's life-changing. It's incredible. Um, and I'm not talking monetary. I'm not talking, you know, it's a major key, but it's just, it's insane. Again, the payoff of seeing people sing it word for word and seeing arenas worldwide sing this song. And yes, a lot of it is part of the sample, but it's the way we flipped it. It was not, background music. We decided to converse with the sample. We decided to embody that. And we did it at a crucial time where now people are kind of just taking that. You know, we kind of shifted things. I started getting briefs from publishers. So when you do publishing companies, that they throw these camps where they invite a bunch of creatives. They give you a paper that says, make something like this. And my homies would hit me up like, yo, bro, like your song is actually like the example. And I'm like, yo, that's crazy. You know? So it went from you go there and that, and now they're looking at you as as that. Not that we invented sampling. Sampling's been fire. Jerry Ross, like, I'm hip. I know what you do. I know what Rashad, you know, I'm hip. But we tapped into something obvious. You know when you hear an obvious slip, you're like, why didn't I think of that before? And you just kind of scratch your head like, damn, all right, on to the next one. And we kind of tapped into that bag, and we executed it perfectly. And life-changing moment for Jack and everybody involved, including myself. Yeah, crazy. There's so many other stories involved with all of this, but I want to take a second and um, kind of talk to some of the people in the room who um, maybe you're like, you're a producer right now, you're an engineer, you're a musician. Uh, I want to kind of talk about some advice that you have for people that are feeling like, man, like maybe it's time to, you know, 
go back to school to, you know, learn about selling diamonds or like take take the job that I've been avoiding or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, like uh -huh. whatsoever, because sometimes that's the move or whatever, and everybody's situation is what it is. But uh, we've had conversations about about these things, and I remember, you know, moments like in the studio where you were you know, talking about like, I don't know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, or like, I don't know if this is it, like I got the pressure of all these things I got to do. Do you have, um, you know, one piece of advice that you can think of from, from those times to where you are now, like, that you would just want to say to somebody that might be like struggling in the audience right now or wondering what the next step is? Um, I think it takes a real level of honesty with oneself when you're in that position, because I had to keep it real with myself and say like, okay, someone's gotta provide, and it's not gonna be my wife. She had gone to massive ovariances that led to the eviction notice and all that stuff that I spoke about, and then that check came in miraculously and saved us, but you gotta keep it real with yourself and have a level of honesty of how much you really love this, more than how good I am at it, you know? You gotta really love it. And it's not, again, if you love it because you want the life and you want the money and you want the fame, that ain't it. It's definitely not for you. So that's really what I could say. There's a lot of hope in it because I think I'm living proof and there's other people in the in the scene here that have shown, you know, on a local level and they've also done stuff outside of the city, you know, across the states. Um, but you just got to love it, man. That's really my only message. You got to love it and be honest with yourself of how really, how much you really love this. Um, I wish I could give some magic words of like, you know, but it, it really isn't as cutthroat. It's either you love this or you don't, whether you're really good at it or not. And it's, if you really love it, keep going. Yeah. Because something will come out of it. If you called uh, Gary tomorrow and suddenly, like, you just got the, like, beep, beep, beep. Like, there's no answer. And everybody's gone. Nobody's calling to make a record. Are you still going to open up Ableton? Absolutely. And keep going, yeah. Yeah, I will always keep going. Music will always be... A part of me because all the creators in this room know that well, you know once it's in you it's just not going to leave you and again it's a very it's a deep love for me it's a it's one of the things i most love i mean it's a gift that god just gave me um he gave me an ear and through mentors like yourself and timbaland and other people that helped me just kind of pointed me in a direction and let me know i had something i turned it into something real dope yeah. um but it's, again, my love for music is really something that I wish I could explain it to y'all, but it's, it's really deep. And I think, you know, the results of my career and what I've been doing kind of show for it. You know, it's a really important thing in my life. I mean, it, it's all day for me. I'm thinking it's crazy. It's hard to shut down sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But it's part, of, it's part of it. I actually should talk about that. You know, I feel like a lot of people, especially here from home, you know, sometimes I'll share stuff on Facebook. My friends know about stuff. And I feel like people feel like, it's all hearts and flowers, you know? And it really isn't. It's a really difficult life. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of that, but I love it. And music is a beautiful, rewarding thing. And again, not money. Being able to feel melody and hear someone sing your song and say, hey, I'm a fan of what you did there. I'm like, That's like the biggest payoff to me. Um, and I think it's possible if you're in this room and it's something that you wanna do, you know, check yourself and ask yourself how much you really love music and what you're willing to give up to do it because those are the people that make it. That's just the, the, the reality. You know, it is what it is. Are you really willing to put everything down for it? If you want to make it to that level, if you want to be an artist that's local, you know, respect, that's also a beautiful walk. I'm not saying you got to go do all this crazy stuff. I think music, you know, if you want to be playing at a beautiful place like this, by the way, the pizza's delicious. I hope y'all tasted it. It's amazing. Um, yeah, by all means, you know, but I just had bigger plans. I feel like I had a voice inside of me that I could help carry through artists like Jack and some of the other artists I've been blessed to work with to carry it to the world. And um, I've taken advantage of that and been able to kind of toast that to the world. Yeah, there was uh, one, this will be our kind of like final note and then we're gonna move on to some Q&A, but there was, um uh, a picture that you mentioned in an interview I saw you recently um, that, you know, you got two guys underground with pickaxes and they're both digging and there's like a, a pit of diamonds. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this oh, yeah. picture before. One guy 
makes it past the first guy or whatever, right? So the two guys, one guy's ahead of him, and you see the diamonds from the side of this thing, and the guy stops one swing short of it, and you still got the other guy back there like pushing through. But I know that for me personally, um, the people who have who have stuck with it because they like you said at the very beginning of this, there's no plan B, you know, this is it. Like in your, deep in your heart, I know it was like this for me where it was just like, there, there is nothing else. Like I thought about computer programming, but I knew that that wasn't the thing that, did, that I wanted to do. Right, right. It's a no plan B and uh, the just keep thinking thing. I know the people that I started with that are still doing it today, the very few are the ones that just never stopped. You know, they didn't give up because they couldn't, you know. Right. So I, I think, like, just an important thing. It's like that was the same with you, like, when you were about ready. You yeah, know, that was definitely system. me. I was definitely yeah. that guy because I had pushed. I had pushed, pushed, and then I made it to that point, and I was getting ready to turn around, and I was just that one little hit away. And a few months later, you know, we, we cracked open, and yeah. everything started making sense. But, again, it took a lot of stretch. It took a lot of time to yeah. get it, and you just got to push through that moment. And again, this applies to not just only music. This applies to life in general. Like, get out there and get it, because mm -hmm. it's possible. I think I've, I've learned the power of manifestation or whatever you want to call it. I believe it comes from God, but if you believe whatever it is that you believe in this room, um, it's definitely attainable, and I prove that to myself every time, you know, yeah. I get out there and I put something out or I'm doing what I'm doing. It's like, it's, it's really powerful stuff. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Man, I couldn't, I mean, all of us couldn't be more proud of you, you know? Thank you for making Columbus proud. And Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you. And I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, whether I know you or I don't, there's a lot of familiar faces, and I'm, I'm really grateful for y'all, for real. Everybody in this room, there's a lot of people that played a crucial, and I'm grateful for y'all. I'm grateful for you guys yeah. coming, listening to me. And um, I love y'all, man. And... Uh, so. Yeah, God bless. I think we're going to do a little bit of questions. Yeah. Uh, my question, you were sharing earlier about the story of when you and Jack began to work together on, on the, your first big, massive hit, right? And you said the song didn't end up, I'm paraphrasing, the song didn't end up to where it is now after a couple of days. Share the process in that in making a massive hit because that wasn't overnight. You took what? couple of days after you first did the initial creation to get it to what, what we what the world hears now what was that process like yeah so the demo I mean it was we had a good hook but it it didn't have the full turnaround musically it wasn't there the the production wasn't candy I had a real harsh because I was tapping into my MPC using older sounds um and I tried it they were a little bit harsh it, it just we have this term we call candy it was an ear candy um and it, the song just kind of, it was a refining process. So it's like you throw everything in the pot and then you have the demo, you know, in the pot. And then you're like, all right, let's keep throwing stuff in there. And you just kind of strip it back. Um, so it was a lot of that. And then songwriting more than anything is getting that hook. You know, we had some ears, industry ears, suits, as we call them, um, just kind of chime in. And it's like, you know, hey, if you're going to sample the song. If we're going to do it, let's go all the way. And we, we made some tweaks. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a process of you're, you're, you're chasing a certain feeling, at least me when I create. It's not necessarily, I was telling him, it's not like by the book or anything. And that's what it was with it. It was like we felt something off the first instinct, which was on the day we created it. But it's like how do we, how do we just make this all the way? How do we take it all the way there? And it was about, I mean, man, it was like a 10-day process broken down. Um, and even post mix, you know, I wasn't happy with the mixes and I just heard that frequency. It just wasn't clicking. Will I am heard the track. He wanted to reproduce. I'm like, I know why he wants to reproduce it. Um, let me handle it very quick. And sure enough, turned it in and yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so will I am wanting to produce it inspired you to, to tweak it to what we hear now? I already knew. But his comment, it, it wasn't, he had some comments on it, you know, because okay. Jack is a very respectful artist. He he likes to personally say, hey, we're doing this or hey, and he's a high class man. Um, and he did that. He reached out to all the creatives and said, hey, this is the song. We're paying homage to y'all. I hope this is a in a tasteful way that you guys, you know, take it with grace and such. And Will I Am did. I mean, genius, by the way. 
um, he wrote that whole thing and um, yeah, he had a comment and as soon as Jack shared the little info with me, I just knew, I just knew what I had to do and we got the, uh, yeah, we got the final result. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Other questions? What's up, Schmiel? Hello, my name is Eric Schmiel. So I just want to preface and say that, Angel, you've been a huge mentor and inspiration to me. Uh, five years ago, he, um, I started working with this little brother, Ignacio, right here. And um, I was just, just gotten into music. And Ignacio and Angel is putting me on some serious games, some serious advice, and like straight up like handed us some like keys and like some real, real advice about bounce and groove, vibe, everything. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you, and I love you for that. You've shown a thank lot of graciousness. OK, this is going to be a very tough question. And I'm oh, sorry, geez. but I, I've wondered about this ever since I've seen it. So with the album, Jack's album, uh, Come Home, The Kids Miss You, um, the first few weeks it came out, I was uh, looking on Twitter and Instagram, and a lot of the fans were saying it didn't hit as hard as the previous album. Mm -hmm. or, or like some, like it was like a spectrum. Some said it was a flop. Some said it was great. But like I've seen a lot about saying it didn't hit as hard. So I was wondering how you and the team took advice like that, maybe not seeing the best um, like media coverage of it or like a lot yeah. of the fans weren't taking to it at first. Like personally, I love the album. It was a, it's a slapper. Congrats. Thank you. Your beautiful grooves. Oh, thank you. Um, Especially like the um, the uh, whistle tone on on uh, Dua Lipa. Oh yeah. Fire, fire. Oh thank but you. I just I was just wondering how you and the team like. Yeah, I like, mean took those words and stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean it's noise. We definitely found out, and it all started. It originated by a tweet that went viral, uh, comparing him to another rapper, and it just started this whole thing. But that's a great question, bro, because that is part of it. You know, sometimes you put you expose yourself, and people laugh or they knock it down but this is where again it comes down to that's something we wanted to do and we're proud of it and we put it out in the world and i think it's bold for anybody whatever it is you're working on the hardest start the, the hardest thing is it, there's this uh marketer guy that i love seth godin and the hardest thing is to ship your product and we shipped it and we were happy we signed it and delivered so from there on you know whether people were rocking to it or not it didn't matter because when we hear these songs we think about the process. We don't think about the results. We don't think about the hit. We think about all the memories that it took to make it and create it. So all that is just noise. All that is just, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, whether they like it or not, whether they listen to the album or not. I just, I love the feeling I get listening to it because I'm proud of the work we did. You know what I mean? And it's important to shut that noise off. Um, it's important to have those blinders and just focus on what's important and it's the process, bro. I had great memories making that album with my team, with Jack and the whole family. Yeah, yeah. it was a vibe. And uh, that Thank TikTok you, of uh, Kentucky Derby, you up on the <laughs> terrace with Drake and Jack. And that, that was, was a, a movie. That was a vibe, yeah. That was definitely a movie. I took my <laughs> yeah. grandfather to the Kentucky Derby, which was a, <laughs> he walked a red carpet. That was full circle too. I love my grandpa, y'all. Yeah, th those clips were a vibe. Uh, congrats. Thank you, yeah. Schmel. Can we get a hand for Angel real quick? Thank you, bro. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. What's going on with you, Angel? Um, I, I want to know, and this is mainly for, you know, just everybody that's getting to that point of, of getting, getting to the place where they feel like they got their success. Now you got your success. You, you, you got the, you know, home, hometown, you know, rooting for you. What's your inspiration or where you find your inspiration for what's going to be next or what's next coming up for you? That's funny you asked that because I was just telling Mark in the room upstairs how I'm feeling it's self-pressure. But, you know, there's these things called one hit wonders. And this is my first hit. Jack has had other hits. He's had three hits. Some of the other producers, collaborators have had other hits. This is my first big one. I've worked on a lot of records. I've gotten some quote unquote hits, but this is a hit, a hit hit. And I'm looking at that thing like this, like what is next, you know? And I'm not sure. I was telling him and he actually advised me. He said, you just gotta remember, you know, go back to the roots, the reason why you're doing this. And that's where I'm tapping in my inspiration is why am I doing this? And it's my love for music. 
Because otherwise, it's very easy to get caught up and look at this thing and say, like, how am I going to top this? And this pressure, it gets to me. I'm human. We're all human. We're all known for, the, you know, whatever your last thing was, whether it was a bad thing or a good thing. Um, but, yeah, that's a great question, man. It's, it's definitely, uh, I don't know what's next. I just know I'm going to keep making music. I'm going to keep my head down, focused, and, um, and keep doing what I love to do. And that's what I encourage anybody else is, like, I, start, I picked up on golf recently. And uh, golf is amazing, by the way. If you don't golf, you got to get on. Don't miss the train. It's a vibe. I, uh, one of the things my instructor taught, has been teaching me is that every time you go up to the ball, it's a brand new shot. Whether your last shot was incredible, whether you pured it or you sliced it or whatever it is, every shot is a brand new shot. And that's how I'm approaching life now. And definitely my career is that was an incredible shot. you know. And maybe the next one's not going to be incredible. Who knows? But I enjoy golf. I enjoy swinging, and I get a satisfaction out of it, and I think that's, I think that's what's next. More golfing and more music. Great question. How was it like being from Columbus? Did you feel like there was like a, a, a certain hunger that you had from being from where we were from that kind of even gave you like a slight advantage in like a lot of these rooms from, you know, people who are like from cities that normally just have like the industry like in their city? Yeah. So in that time, not that I wasn't welcome, but I hadn't, like I said, I hadn't earned my stripes. You know, it was, I was new to the local scene. I was doing music with my brother MC Magic, which is a whole different lane as the Chicano music. He's actually like an icon in Chicano music. Like his, 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 he's, he's made some forever records. I was really focused on that. But then when I met Pedro and I saw the scene, I'm like, yo, this is the hip scene. Like, this is who I have to be tough. Bro, your stuff, J-Ro, I was like blown away, bro. Like, you're incredible, by the way. Huge fan. Um, yes, yes. Give it, give it up for him. Um, so yeah, I, I was, yeah, man. I, I was really inspired by Rashad AU, AU. What it do? Shout out to AU, another guy, Columbus legend. Um, and I just didn't find my spot necessarily. Like we did a cool song. We did a the two vans, one chain. I remember, you know, riding around. Uh, short North, listening, you know, people bumping that song. So classics. This whole there was like a lot culturally happening in the city around the, that time in music, and it was very inspiring. And I took it with me, and I said, "You got to earn your stripes, um, but you got to think, you know, bigger. How do we? I want to come back around to the city and do it." And it does carry because th there's something about Midwest people that we have. You know, there's something special in these grounds. I don't know if it's humility. I don't know what it is, but people could tell. You know, when we're in the room, Jack could tell. We knew we were from the Midwest. Um, and it's it's came back full circle for me where some of those tendencies, that hunger of 09 and that era, um, it shifted into the bigger rooms for me. You know what I mean? Of proving oneself, earning the stripes, um, and making it about that. Because it was I never took it personal. That's the one thing that I recommend everybody don't take stuff personal. You know, there's a lot of perception stuff in, in on the walk to success that you have to understand. That's one of the biggest things, and I never took it personal. I saw it as a, a way for me to prove myself amongst peers that I looked up to, you know? Incredible musicians here, rappers and such. So, yeah, bro. Can I chime in on that? What a good time, yeah. Man, um, one of the things like I've been thinking while we've been up here, uh, when I was you know, starting out, or like even in like our early days or any of that, I would have... Uh, I would have rode my bike when I lived up in Mansfield. I would have rode my bike down 71 if I knew that an event like this was happening, where I could come and meet somebody of your caliber and like just sit down in a room with other like-minded people like this. So I want to say like shout out to the Music Commission for making stuff like this happen. I agree. It's just an amazing, I agree. amazing thing. I agree, because I feel like they're breaking the ground of something that's in my heart, and it is to come back to the Midwest and find talent and find ways to incorporate more local people. It's what I did when I called Mark. Anytime I call Mark, he answers my call, and I, I wanted to replay these drums, and I reached out to my friend, Steven Bustos, who I met in church, Costa Rican kid, amazing. He's got the craziest pocket, and sure enough, I got them on the Jack, you know, on the Jack album, and which you're also Grammy-nominated for your contribution. Um, Cause you engineered, so oh, oh, oh. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's something that I'm excited about. I'm glad that there's something like this happening in the city, and um, 
you know, let's see where it goes. Let's continue to support each other. Um, I think there's something brewing in the city, and I, I definitely want to use some of the leverage that I've gained and some of these keys that I've gained access to to find talent and put people on. It takes time. It's not going to be overnight. But I think there's something in the city, and it's the hunger, it's the humility, and it's the talent. Um, and we could really make it happen. L you know, Jack just showed me last night. I'm very inspired. He showed me what it's like. And I'm not saying I'm going to be an artist and do something like that, but I think I could find somebody here and propel them into that into that position and really become a power uh in the conversation of the mid of midwest music you know there's a lot of talent here man a lot so yeah yeah I, uh, I got uh one more one more thing to just kind of oh, point oh, out oh, about go, 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 go. the uh, about the jack record um when you guys had that thing uh with what Angel was just mentioning was um, one of the songs he he needed a, a drum loop played, so I like got the call graciously got the call, um, and that was something that you know they have uh, I hear they have a couple drummers in L.A. I think there's like a few people that play drums out there. There's also some people that have microphones to record them, and you did not need to make that call back home if you didn't want to. So that was like that was something that like I'll never. I'm always gonna call that. home, bro. That's it. Yeah. Have to. There's yeah. a lot of incredible people here. One of my favorite singer-songwriters is here, too. His name's Jake. You're incredible, brother. You're very inspiring. I'm not going to talk about your story, but I hope you know that you're walking life right now, and Roz, you as well. I went to school with Roz, um, but y'all inspire me. So just know that, you know. Um, I'm not going to talk about your story, but you're amazing, bro. You two are amazing. And... This man's voice is incredible. His music is incredible. He sends me music that literally brings me and shakes me down to tears. So let's tap in with local artists and let's find these gems because there's beautiful people like him, producers, artists. Um, I think we could do something special in the city. So, yeah, thank you so much. I don't know the song. Thank you, guys. Everybody, let's give it a hand for Angel and for Mark. You know, thank you very much, both you guys. And I'm from the Bronx, and that's why I'm here in Columbus, man, because I feel the same way you do. It's, it's all here, and we're going to make it happen. We're going right. to give people the opportunity to get, put their music out, and build the infrastructure that can help propel them. Give them the tools, give them the time, give them the money. Uh, I think it's possible, man. This city's popping. I came back and it's crazy out here. It's like, there's a scene, there's hunger. You know, the city has changed a lot and we could definitely make that happen. And I'm excited to, again, use some of my, uh, you know, some of the keys I've gotten for, for that advantage. You're in trouble, you're in trouble. I have your phone number. <laughs> Let's do it. I appreciate everybody that came out, family, friends, family, if I don't know you. Very grateful. Um, thank you so much, real. God bless y'all. Happy holidays. Thank you to Bruce and everybody involved in making this happen.